Hello everyone, this is DJ, this is Marco, Michal, and this is CG Talks, the podcast where CG guys talk about CG, and tonight with us we have a special guest, the heaviest of polys, Mr. Von Ling. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, we're pretty excited for the, for the episode. Uh, um because we're kind of all fans of your artwork i think at least i can yeah say i've been following that's a, a lot of that'd your, be an understatement I, yeah. even yeah. a lot yeah. of your endeavors uh, a lot of your artworks and uh, and recently i've been playing also with your digital app that you're developing so maybe yeah. introduce yourself to our audience but just before that, uh, Marco, I can hear you, but you are very, um, very silent. Oh, am I? Really? I Even know, now? Yeah. Also. Yeah, your a volume was better before. Um, oh no. You're a little bit soft, but it's. Uh, okay. Is Still it closer, like closer to the like, mic? Maybe. <laughs> I, I'm at like I'm at kissing distance at this point. That that sounds normal, actually. But also, oh, this is okay. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Um, we so I'm I'm recording into Audacity also so uh, hopefully like the the transients look like they're okay at least in Audacity so okay yeah um, we'll be, all right we'll so be all right. I guess for to introduce myself I'm uh, working in, in animation stuff here in Los Angeles I worked on TV stuff. Um, I, I worked on uh, Spider Into the Spider Verse more recently, and um, Love, Death, and Robots: The Witness. And so I guess my work is sort of a mixture of two D and three D stuff. Um, I'm actually a fan of Garage Farm. I've I've used Garage Farm in the past, and and they were really kind to me, even though I screwed up my oh, renders. Shucks. But um, and yeah, so lately I've been working on an uh, a painting app called Heavy Paint because i was um i was going out painting with a, a local group here every weekend we would use uh gouache paints and or watercolor or whatever and just just go out and paint and um and then i wanted to try painting on my phone and i had just a couple tools that i really wanted like just very basic stuff and so i tried to learn how to do it like watching a youtube tutorial or something like that and just made a little thing to try out and then and then I took it on a trip played with it and posted online and then other you know some friends were like oh can you send that to me and so I started sending it out to people to try and then it just kept kept going from there and now it's been like two years working on this thing and that's like my main project right now Man. yeah it's been a lot of fun that's it's crazy. And you, you <clears throat> like, had you, did you have any kind of like coding experience before? Um, or did you just like, this is it, is it based on the Godot engine or? Yeah, it is. It's based on Godot engine, which is uh, an open source game engine. It's similar to yeah. Un Unity and, uh, you know, Unreal Engine. But it's, it's, I like to think of Godot engine like it's like the Blender equivalent of game engines it's since it's open source it's very small size very quick to to open and it's very good performance especially on older devices so that's mm -hmm. something that really attracted me to it and in terms of uh previous experience i i all i had done before was making scripts and like pi menus and ui stuff for blender because mm -hmm. um you know, I like to customize the interface and um, make things a little bit cleaner and simpler for, for the stuff that I do a lot. So I just make write a little script to, to automate something. And then the only way to do that in Blender is with Python. So I kind of learned Python through Blender. And then GDC, ah. you know, Godot also uses a Python-like language. So it was kind of a easy to switch over. Nice. Yeah. That's really cool. Actually, I was um. Well, I I had a few questions lined up, but that that basically answers a couple of them. But then, 
um i uh yeah like i noticed like in 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 your work it's like that 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 sort of seems to be like a like a recurring theme i like i don't know if it's um if if it was deliberate or 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 it just comes out but but it's like there's a lot of elegance in the stuff that you do like it's especially especially in um your 2d work and like i really like how you're able to to create something readable um with seemingly like uh like really concise like strokes and i mean it but then i've also seen like some of your work for uh like i think i've i saw like one of your um your line drawings for one of the sets i think it was um peter parker's oh sorry miles's um uh, uncle's apartment. apartment yeah 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 and uh it i mean like i was telling dj before the call it's like it's it's insane because like the draftsmanship is really good and your perspective is super on point um but then you're also like you also play a lot in like the looser um side of, of yeah uh, 2d well, stuff and... i guess maybe i can explain the draftsmanship part as coming from uh, my background with industrial design. So I, I went to school for mm -hmm. industrial design and automotive design in Detroit. And, you know, they make you do a lot of the perspective stuff and a lot of just line drawing. So, you know, in school, I it was only drawing. They didn't teach you much about like painting. We We did learn about rendering, which is sort of like a shorthand version of painting where you're just trying to like describe the forms as quickly as possible. Right. So, yeah that's where that's like kind of the side the way i was approaching things for a long time was just like how do we describe this as efficiently and quickly as possible this shape yeah that's in your head and that that's the whole point and you know that that kind of training like vis visual communication training stuff that stuff um you know started before compute uh you know before computers a lot of the industrial design people were just like hand drawing all the orthographics right, yeah. and everything so you know you had to be kind of clear and quick with it i guess um but at the same time i started working in uh toys and stuff so we we did have to do orthographic drawings there and so i got to experience that and and i realized i really hated doing ortho drawings because they're very tedious and boring you know to draw so that's kind of how I got into 3D stuff, too, is because it's a tool that makes it so you don't have to do this boring ortho drawings. You can just make a model and say, this is yeah. the shape that I want exactly. You know, it, there's no translating between 2D and 3D is a lot of work and things, little details get missed all the time if you're working with a another person who's making the model. So it's it's much right. more direct if you can make the shape exactly how you want it yourself so that's how that's how i got into 3d stuff wow so you never even really oh sorry go ahead i kind of have had an um, impression when i was looking at your sketches that they re re, re remind me architect architectural drawing like this kind of um, quick uh, liner uh, drawing with some with good feeling of perspective, but basically to sell the idea uh, with the with the sketch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like um, I feel like industrial design is sort of a cousin with architecture, where like the nerdy, it's in between engineer and artist sort of a thing, somewhere in the middle. But, yeah, yeah, I mean on on first year of architecture, at least uh, where I studied. We did some um, some designs like that as an introduction, and just to to be aware that something like that exists. So it's uh, it's a similar uh, field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wanted to ask uh, about the heavy paint thing, the the app uh, where you focus on the dig digital painting side, like uh, mm, yeah, so more on the artistic side uh, in the digital form, but it's uh, like very like you know painting very artistic venue and uh, do you keep this like uh, worlds apart with the modeling this more technical like vehicle design and stuff 
that you do in the Mac design? Actually, do you do you keep it like worlds apart, or do you try to no, combine no. them somehow in your works? No, no, they're they're not separate at all, actually, because the the painting, like the past few projects I've worked on, have been all about getting the paintings into three D as closely as possible. So, like Spider Verse, The Witness, the latest one yeah. I worked on was also very very heavily based off paintings like digital paintings but actually on the camera because when most of the time there's people that there's separate jobs right there's somebody who does the concept art slash paintings then there's somebody who does the 3d and then there's somebody who like does the compositing and all that and it, and what happens is like it from the painting or the sketch to the screen it changes a lot and it's not it's not the same so yeah, this whole thing is all about like directness and make taking the actual pixels from the painting and putting them directly onto the screen as much as possible so that it's not there's no longer a line between concept art and production art. It's the same thing, you know. It, yeah, I'm, I I was just curious about whoa. this because uh, because of the uh, thing that Blender evolves into some somehow, you know, we, we, it's it's somehow like very favorable for concept artists right now. Like you had like Jama Jubai and people like that jumping mm -hmm. into Blender and finding it like a perfect tool for this kind of job. Mm -hmm. And it kind of starts to incorporate a lot of tools like like you mentioned, you know, the grease pencil that's developed as a two D three D mixture and all of these things uh, that can be yeah mixed together and done in a one, one single package and mm -hmm. yeah, cre just creatively used. Yeah, Blender's Blender's pretty amazing, and I'm sure you guys know that because you deal with Blender a lot. And like, Heck I'm yeah. I'm guessing that probably the past year or two, you've seen much much more Blender activity happening for Garage Farm. Maybe yeah. uh, it's growing. It's growing. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. When, when it comes to number of customers, yes, but not especially for the size of the projects yet. Oh, okay. So yeah. it's yeah. mostly like, like hobbyists and smaller people. Yes. Mm -hmm. It seems that way. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, like, I on personally, I think the fact that we've seen such a huge, like, spike in, like, the influx of, you know, um, Blender users, uh, like, there's a lot of, I, I'm, I'm really hopeful because honestly, I mean, personally, I didn't think that um like i i've been using blender uh since day one in garage farm and it just never really seemed like like you'd hardly ever see uh like people rendering with blender for for so long and um there was always sort of this sense that like uh like maybe like blender might not ever really make it into um like as an industry st standard for this or that reason but then i've always really kind of felt that it ought to mm -hmm. um but then i figured okay like you know like i understand like there are i mean the costs of having to to retrain like your 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 teams and everything outweigh the benefits of you know yada yada, yada. and so i figured like yeah i mean i'm sure there are practical like constraints and uh maybe maybe it just won't happen and then 2.8 came out and then it just kind of exploded yeah um and it's been picking up momentum since and it's yeah it's really great like i'm really i'm personally really excited and i think it's only a matter of time before like we start seeing uh we start getting like really really big customers rendering in blender um over at the farm yeah yeah it's definitely a long journey for for those kind of open source projects, but I'm, I'm glad yeah. they're making it now. Gives me hope too know, with my little it's... project that maybe someday, you know, it starts out little, but you just have to have patience, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you know? I mean, like just based on on everything that's because I've like yeah, like based on based on a lot of like open source stuff that's been out there for some time that's getting like huge attention now. I think. I think it's almost safe to say it's just a matter of time. Yeah. Um, but yeah. since you worked with uh, on Spider Verse project, so you work, you have a experience in working uh, with a professional studio with a very professional project. Uh, do you uh, 
uh, suspect or, or know what are the reasons why uh, many studios are not treating Blender yet as, a, as just a normal part of the pipeline? Well, so there, are... I, think it's a, I think it's a process because, um, well, what's happening now, I think, is a lot of the concept art departments are getting introduced to Blender. And that's like where it has its first entryway because, you know, the concept art side, you know, that, that doesn't require changing the entire pipeline yet. If just a few right. viz dev artists are using it, which is like what I was doing. So like they don't mind me using Blender because their pipeline stays Maya, it stays intact, like they don't have to change too much. But I think eventually, once you know, more people slowly it starts trickling in and people are like, oh wait, it can do this stuff that we can't do. Maybe we should try using it. But it it is very difficult though, because it's like it's not just a handful of artists, it's like an entire building full of artists that are all using Maya, right? So hmm. it's not easy to just say, oh, I'll throw that out. Let's try something new today. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's it's probably going to take a long time. Or the other option is probably what I think will happen is a lot of smaller studios that are starting out will, will be using it. And that's how it'll like start to gain a lot of momentum that way when small studios make successful projects with it. And uh, yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking that it's also the the game development uh, department, like the the whole industry, is a little bit more, like on the edge of experimentation on many st many stuff like like software use, for example, like if you take a look on 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 the game artists forums or or just in even you know work uh, like positions that are <clears throat> requirements for positions for for game uh, game artists there are a lot of let a lot more blender you know related jobs or you know, postings or stuff like that yeah and i think that's that's because it's yeah it's a little bit more open it's and like you said the, about the concept art department i think it's also a little bit more yeah open for experimentation like innovation and just yeah yeah it's more flexible because it doesn't have mm -hmm. to fit into the giant machine directly you know <laughs> So yeah. you can kind of like float around outside it, and not. I was pretty. It. I was pr pretty surprised by by one of the Blender conference uh, announcements where where the guys from 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 a card designer uh, department, yeah. you know, in one of the companies said that Kiss, they were Kiss, experimenting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've with, uh, with I've I've uh, I know Koenig Sig, I think was using Blender. You know the supercar people, and um, you know Honda has been reaching out to to try to every uh, they're all trying to just do the do it you know the most efficient way with the least amount of money i guess so if blender is that tool then everyone will eventually go there i guess but uh yeah it's it's on the way it's on the way definitely i think yeah exciting yeah. times what about um like how's your cuz i know you also do uh or I'm not sure if you still do it now, but do you still like do like Blender training, like corporate uh, training, and yeah, Blender, yeah, with yeah. I've, I've done a few. Like I, I was, I did a little workshop at DreamWorks TV a couple of years ago. Um, I've done little workshop. I did a moto workshop at Trek Bicycle, so I've tried to do a few of those over the years, and um, and yeah, teaching online also has been sort of a big thing for me too um especially yeah. uh you know i mean it's nice because i it, allow, it allows me to be more flexible too with my schedule and i can you know also work on these side projects like heavy paint so you know if i was um doing a full-time thing uh, there's no way i could you know do this side project at the same time so yeah yeah for sure but man that's that's really cool. Like how how um did you notice like any more like did your did the number of um students um, like have more corporations like reached out to you since 2.8 maybe or Well, I mean it and uh, yeah, yeah, students do, you know, for, for for me it's yeah, it's been good. It's been not like a huge explosion for me, but I mean it's still going. I, doesn't seem to be slowing down at all so I, it's good enough for me at least 
Nice. Yeah. Wow, that's really cool. Um, so like, what what what's it like, kind of working with um, like, what was it like working uh with the everyone else at Love, Death and Robots and Spider Verse? Was like, was were, were these things that you were able to do remotely as well? Or? Um, well, Spider Verse was in person, and that was a very interesting project. Um, you, uh, I don't know if you guys know Alberto Mielgo, but I've been kind of following him around for a long time um we we first work on worked on a tron uprising in like 2012 so i kind of like oh cool really love his style love the way he he uh you know does his art directing and everything because i feel like um with him you kind of learn a lot just by being around and uh seeing how he does stuff um He's very, like, he treats everybody the same, you know what I mean? Like, even the janitor to the, to the wow, CEO, cool. he's, like, going to be this, he's going to yeah, treat everyone yeah. the same way. And he's going to, you know, if he doesn't like you, he'll let you know. If he likes you, he'll also, yeah. he's very honest and all that and very blunt. So it's, and then, but also, like, with work. He's he's very honest too, and and usually when he has suggestions or he gives you advice, it's it's usually stuff where I'm like, wow, okay, that's that's way better than what I had in mind. So, thank you. You know, it's like uh, I'm learning every time yeah. I get feedback from him. So I'm I feel wow. pretty lucky to be around him, and and also the nice thing is that he he tends to attract a lot of the best painters too. Um, onto his projects so i get to see like the most incredible graphic rich like super i don't know abstract it's like christmas every time there's a an art review you know every week there's art coming in from everywhere we had like craig mullins and neil ross campbell and peter chan and all these crazy people that Whoa. you know i've i've seen their work online and and been big fans of them all these years and then I get to be working on the same project is always like really exciting. So I'm definitely very lucky and, and happy to work work with those guys. Yeah, I was I was a bit wow. curious about how, how it happened that you got to be involved in this uh, this kind of a project sure. of that of that size and was it was it just a bite from an sure, from sure. A radioactive spider or something well, like this? <laughs> Well, something more um less casual. It's it's not too exciting. Actually, I I will um humble brag a little bit that uh Alberto was the first person on that project like before they even had a director, right? So there's nobody in this whole floor at Sony is empty except for him in his office. And then he called me and said, "Hey, you want to work on the Spider-Man thing?" I went there, empty office. He showed me the paintings that he was working on and and I was like, okay, let's do it. And then uh and that and that was it. So I was like I was the first uh VizDev artist in the office for them. And there was one other uh there was a storyboarder there also named Miguel. And then they got the director also um in between that time too. So we were got to be very lucky there. But uh, honestly, like with Alberto, I like I said, I've been following him around since like 2012 so every you know a lot of projects i've kind of just he'll just call me up and say hey do you want to do this and i usually say yes um and uh i can say like that first one the the tron thing was also a very lucky thing i i know i keep saying lucky and it's maybe annoying for people that are trying to get into the industry you know because it's like you know how lucky can you be but i can i can only talk about like what worked how it worked for me personally was I was posting online a lot on blogs, you know, like blogspot.com. And I had a little circle of friends on blogspot and I would um, see their work and write comments and they write on my, my page. And we just, you know, talk to each other for every once in a while. And then I was in Los Angeles for um, an internship at the toy company and that was coming to an end. So I was going to about to go back to school in Detroit and finish up my school um, when I got an email from um, 
from uh, Anis Naim, who's a, another concept art guy. But we were just friends on the internet. Like we never met each other before in person. He didn't know if I was a psycho murderer or something. He had no idea. He just, all he knew was my work. And he saw like, I, I had been doing some like futuristic spaceships for fun that were kind of like very minimal, sleek stuff. And he saw that and said, oh, maybe this will work for our Tron TV show. So he emailed me and told me, hey, I'm leaving this job. Do you want to take my spot? Um, and I said, OK. And then I went. And so I I, I bought a, like a dress shirt. Like I didn't have any clothes or anything because I, I was just coming from school to for internship and I was about to leave and I didn't have a car or anything. So I just um, rented a car, I think, for that day because I think there wasn't any uh, Uber yet. So I just rented a car, got a got a dress shirt and and drove over there and 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 did an inter- interview and that was it it's 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 crazy i don't wow. i don't i got i can't believe it worked like that but really it's just none of that would have happened though if if i didn't have like that stuff online and like been talking to to anise for maybe like over a year and having putting myself out there a lot um i don't know yep I have impression that the key was also the fact that you you were doing the thing you liked. So this this uh, this uh, spaceships was something you did as your you know like passion work yes. or hobby like yeah. just for and yeah and I think that like these two things combine like do the stuff you like and you really enjoy and then show it to people yeah. that can attract some some people interested. it's that's so important like especially for um i know a lot of a lot of people get very um locked in on their portfolio early on and they also get locked in on how do i make my work into something that is marketable for the industry you know or how do i make the thing that yeah. this company might like but it really should be the other way around. Like you really do have to be doing what you're passionate about. And if that happens to fit with some company somewhere, they will recognize it. Hopefully if your stuff is out there enough and, and hopefully reach out. But I mean, I don't know. It's, it's tough for me to try to give advice on this. Cause, cause that's just what ha- worked for me. Like that's what I've found throughout, through the years. It's just, it has, it's always me doing a personal project just for myself purely for no reason at all not for school not for somebody else not for work it's just for yourself mm-hmm. it's very selfish and that that those are the projects that always uh lead to the next thing you know yeah man i don't know i mean like like i have zero authority on 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 like on any of this but i will say that like at least to me i mean like your your work really does stand out um i guess precisely because it's something that it's something that you do for you first like the level of i don't know like the level of um expression for example in your in your paintings are i mean like i don't really see that many of that like relative to um like the the kind of how would you say it like the om- like the the stereotypical like concept art looks mm-hmm. which isn't to say there aren't like a lot of really cool artists also doing their own thing it just seems like uh yeah it really does seem like majority um like majority of the time uh it it seems like we're like a lot of work is being put out there that's oriented towards um kind of appeasing like one studio or another's yeah. kind of aesthetic it's yeah you know so yeah it's more... I, find, I find oh sorry go ahead yeah. so i find i find that you kind of like had this similar similar approach to developing heavy paint like i've watched some some of your live streams where when you're you know testing out the new features and stuff and uh you were talking about you know some critical uh, notes from from UI designers that you get you know and and you try to kind of like go your own way and sort sort of like follow your intuition on 
on how things should be because you're really developing it for yourself, kind of like trying to solve your own problems. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's it's kind of hitting the mark. At least I was playing it <laughs> with heavy paint a little bit, uh, on, at least on my cell phone. And I was trying out a, a few apps like, I don't know, Autodesk Sketchbook or stuff like that, you know, with a little bit more fancy, you know, brush features or... And it seemed to be like the simplicity of your design kind of worked for, for the simple device. At, at least I found it more appealing to me for, for a mobile device than, than on uh, on desktop. Mm -hmm. That was my, my impression. Cool. And yeah. Probably that was your main, yeah, the, your main focus first, like because of the letter interfaces with super simplified. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely tried to, you know, list my prior priorities of what I think is the most important and then build the interface from that backwards. And, and I will say that the, uh, the list of priorities for, for most apps is very different from my personal priorities and and then yeah and like all uh, i i got um unsolicited messages and emails from professional like ui people who had used heavy paint and they were like you know you can do this this and this to make it better and i was like no no those are all things that would make it more like the other apps that i see that are mm -hmm. i i believe are not optimized for painting um so yeah i don't know i'm maybe it's something about me where i'm just like i think i know what i'm i think i know what i'm doing maybe i'm too cocky or something but i always sort of trust my own uh instincts most of the time and i think that that like leads me down these weird pathways a lot where um it, it gets weird but uh usually it, it ends up okay <laughs> you know but uh, yeah, so, that's that's so, that's kind of like uh, a bit dangerous, you know, to to walk this untread, untreaded paths. But I guess that's the only way to find out whether whether it works. Like someone someone has to go that route. Yeah, yeah. And check. But, but I'm curious. Yeah. And it's clearly working I'm, for I'm you, curious, right? What, uh, what are these priorities for this app which you mentioned? What what um, most important? Well, number one, when you're painting, is you need to be able to pick colors, mix colors. Mm -hmm. And if you notice 99% of apps don't have color picking as a first class of the UI. Yeah. Like you have to click on a button in order to get to the color mixing. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yes. Yes. So, so think about how many yeah. times you have to pick your color every time you do a painting. Is it thousands of times, tens of thousands Hello. of times? Right? Yeah. Every single time yeah, you have yeah, to do an extra sure. click to get there. That adds up very quickly. So it's little things like that. Every single click is extremely important when you're when you're doing these highly repetitive tasks, you know? Yeah, it's, it slows down the whole loop. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. It's, it's yeah. so so you start to think different way a little bit because it stops the that this do doodling mode in your head. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah. I'm I'm not it's saying that those apps killer. are wrong. I'm saying that they have a different list of priorities. Mm -hmm. Like they work properly for what they are trying to do, which is probably to be bigger. Like they most apps are much, much bigger than heavy paint. They have more way more functionality. They have like selection tools, they have uh, you know, calligraphy and illustration stuff and they have like auto shapes and things pen tools there's just so much more functionality that you can't like you can't fit it all so you have to like uh decide what's the most important and i i, I guess like you know they have to choose pick and choose what they want to highlight and what to make big um so i guess that's an advantage that i have right now is that the app is very s relatively small although yeah. it's getting to the point now where with you know i'm adding layers and stuff where I'm having to start to make more difficult choices of what to keep and what to to hide, you know. So it's it's tricky. <laughs> I think you know, mm. like some of the of the software developers, especially recently, like V-Ray, they made like versions of the software, like the the modes. And the first one is the the simplest one. You don't have to go into these more complicated options. 
so it's you know like so it's compact it's it's fast i also noticed that your uh, your your app is very very fast and i wouldn't be worried at some point i had some problems with krita that you know installing more and more software on my computer at some point there was there was some problems with uh, with um, um with the responsiveness not um, like a very, very little very little from from times to times but mm. it's it's destroying the whole the whole momentum of of banking yeah. so and, and i noticed that your i, I unpacked your um uh, archive downloaded from your website and it didn't install the the app on my computer this is just a file where i had to do a shortcut right so yeah yeah it's, so is, is there any yeah, specific reason for that no reason that that's just how godot engine exports stuff that's also how godot works like there's no installer also like blender mm -hmm. doesn't have any installer a lot of these open source things don't have installer although i'm not open source but i'm like coming from this open source thing so they kind of just and i honestly i like that way more because it's more portable you can just put it on yeah. a drive and copy it somewhere and then you just run it you don't yeah. have to install anything or yeah, or exactly. uninstall can... right? just delete it <laughs> especially for example when, when you are a teenager and you spend time at your dad's work and he doesn't want <laughs> you to install any stuff yeah, exactly. on his work computer <laughs> yeah yeah totally <laughs> Yeah. But I noticed there was there, there's one uh, tool that I haven't uh, uh, I haven't m met before. Uh, this is one of the brushes where you uh, you paint with the brush and it kind of like creates some kind of uh, um, like a shape which is following your mouse, but it's mm -hmm. not really drawing. So what what's the what 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 stands behind the idea of this brush? Why wh uh, what is it for? Are you talking about the the fill brush where you you draw a shape and it fills it in with color? No, no. I mean it um it um it creates uh um you can choose different shapes, but it creates something like um oh my god, I forgot the word <laughs> in English. Like a lasso. The, Kind of a... uh, the the stuff the stuff with for example comet comet has, uh, oh, uh, like a trail. Type? Yeah, exactly. And our and when you when I so so first I used it, so I thought that this is kind of like more or less randomly drawing the line. But I noticed that this point where I started drawing that that part is actually moving, and it's it's like this. Um, oh, like it's stretching, yeah. right? It's stretching yeah like stretching but also but also the, but also moving right i mean i i think i noticed that uh that that point where I, where i started drawing uh, that in that place it, it moved out from that place yeah well what's happening there is um i have a, a mode where the texture the brush texture follows your stroke and it stretches out so um yeah as it stretches it stretches along the length of the entire curve so it it might like seem like it's shifting a little bit um mm -hmm. depending on oh, which yeah. texture you use if you use a texture that like doesn't end right at the end of the border of the image then it will seem to shift a little bit because it's stretching oh. but if you use a texture that's like going right up to the edge of the image then it will stay like locked on that you know oh. bit point but uh yeah everything is based off points too or like vector kind of based it's 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 similar to grease pencil, I guess. It's in it's like sort of like three D geometry ish, and I think that's how I'm. I think it it runs pretty quickly that way, like because uh, I think a lot of apps tend to do like a repeat where they they take a texture stamp and they repeat it along a curve, but mm -hmm. my my method is more like just stretching one texture along a curve, um, or you know playing with the UVs to get weird random stretching effects and uh i'm trying to be efficient about it but it's tricky but the one benefit of that too is that you can draw something and because it's all stored as points in strokes um that means you can re like you can rebuild the canvas at any size you want so you can say like you know i drew it at 320 by 320 i want to render it at 1920 by 1920 because it's just like a 3d model you know 
Wow. Um, and so you can go back and forth, you know, and no, no loss in quality, which I think is cool. And I noticed that there is a left-handed mode. Yes. Which I, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that we are in the same, the same yeah. uh, sect. Yeah. We will take over the world one day. Right, one day. right. I think, but, <laughs> uh, I, I was going to say like, I don't know about you, but I, I feel sensitive to UI maybe because of being lefty, because all throughout our lives, we are presented with things that are a little bit off or like not correctly designed for us. Right. So yeah. we're like, huh. And then, so I, I feel like I feel much better. I, or I notice much better when things are, are right for me, you know, and then I, I really like get very picky and, and OCD about that kind of stuff. <laughs> So, I get it. so talking about this stuff, I need to ask the question: uh, Are you right click or left click selecting Blender? Oh, left click, <laughs> left click for sure. Left click. Are you you right click? No, I I, I was when it was not an option, but right now I, I'm just following the trend. Yeah, I guess I, I just switched. Right. So. Oh, nice, nice. It doesn't seem doesn't seem to make you know like this kind of a fundamental difference for, for me. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe less fundamental than this 3D cursor. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, did you have problems as a left-handed kid, like when you were at school? Because I don't know how it looks. It, it looked in uh, other countries, but in Poland, I, in Poland I, I was growing up in times be between between the times where you were forced to not use your left hand and like my grandfather oh wow and times where it's fine so i, I was kind of be, being ashamed by by teachers maybe and some adults that i'm left-handed and it was like concerned like a good uh piece of advice that i would learn to to use right hand because i don't know i have a problems with scissors so and i so you were forced you were forced to do right right hand i was lucky that i wasn't like oh, i was this okay. this generation that i only met this like like the 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 remains of this of this of this yeah, uh, yeah. practice wow yeah that's that's amazing uh well well i i guess yeah we I, they didn't force me to to do to do righty or anything but yeah there is that still there is the still like you know, left-handed is for the devil and all that stuff, right? It's it's still <laughs> there a little bit, which makes sense. It it practically it makes sense if you're trying to make a you know a nice smooth society. You want everyone to be using the same hand. That way, we ha have to design half as many products for half as many people, right? You know, it's it makes sense to yeah. standardize that. Um, you know, in in time in time, I grew up in times of communism in Poland, so in these times. Uh, there were, you know, there were no private companies that would create some stuff for left-handed. So people were, people were adjusted to to the product <laughs> rather than yeah, the, yeah, the other way. The, the only, the only, I, I, I have never thought actually about how being left-handed um, is affecting my the way I'm using graphic user interface in on computers, but actually buying my first tablet for drawing was a problem. Like uh, all the all the buttons were on the left side. Oh, and, right. And you know, like, so how can I like lay my hand and to draw without uh, uh, pushing? Them? Yeah, that's true. That's true. But also notice that when I was I used your uh, your application and yeah I I haven't spent enough time with it to really understand the whole whole UI but for sure it showed me that at least in my in my case I ha I have a lot of um, habits because I was in some cases I was looking for some options in places where they were not located <laughs> but also this but this color picker. I noticed that that this is this is this is much faster. So in Krita it's a little better. In Photoshop it's a tra tragedy, uh, unless I know there are some plugins there to for for color picker. 
and yeah I, and i was i was thinking that maybe some of them are your personal um personal um um choices like this little button on the top i don't remember for what it was like a little very little bar and I, actually this is something i don't <laughs> i don't like in software i like when i have to click on something that is big <laughs> like I don't, yeah. I don't have to you know uh target yeah, very yeah precisely well i will say that some of the things in that version particularly uh are a bit hidden by design like mm -hmm. uh you might have been looking for opacity control and there is no opacity obviously uh, or the, you, there is no visual opacity control you kind of have to discover it <laughs> which uh -huh. is maybe a bad thing because like a lot of people are like where do i do opacity but uh i tried to design it too where like you it you discover things as you go as you need them so you don't have mm -hmm. everything like all at once so there's like rotation control and opacity control are both hidden in that version if you if you stumble upon them accidentally then you, then you know where they are and like that little bar you're talking about is just to like move move the the interface around i don't i don't know it's just like yeah so some of the stuff is a little bit obscure but the the newer version will is i think i'm a bit compromising more compromising on the newer version where i'm trying to make things a little bit more accessible and less cryptic <laughs> because i know may, maybe it's like not not great to to be like purposely confusing people <laughs> you know you want that, that was you did it on purpose to confuse, to confuse no no not to purposely confuse but to purposely no, hide I, or no. to purposely withhold things at first be, so that they don't get overwhelmed you know because i i also think that opacity control is like is really bad for digital painters i think it ruins a lot of digital painters mm -hmm. especially when you're starting out because you don't ever learn how to mix colors if you're using opacity all the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was. Yeah, wanted to ask about this. Uh, yeah, I was. Whether oh. you're fully digital right now with artwork, or still kind of like play with a traditional medium somehow? Because I, I found a big difference between uh, the digital artwork and the traditional artwork is that the lack of undo in the traditional medium, like mostly, it's. It's some. It seems like a like a like an obstacle, somehow. But it also kind of helps you, you know, because what uh, at least I, that's what I love about the ink drawing, for example. I I do ink drawings sometimes even without you know without a pencil under sketch or whatever, just to have this line where I put the line on the paper. It's just there and it has to stay, and it it kind of teaches you to to be more decisive when when drawing. I totally agree, man. It's like, yeah, there's no undo, undo but look at look at all these people that they they turned out fine without the undo right like leonardo da vinci he was fine without undo mm -hmm. so like <laughs> maybe maybe yeah. it's better to not have undo who knows yeah, think about the these sculptors in in, in marble right yeah. <laughs> yeah just chip off and it's gone yeah i was actually wondering if like your if if um heavy paint like sort of is designed to follow like the more, yeah like, traditional medium yes philosophy. yes for sure it was if i mean like, sort of i said i was going doing for. a lot of yeah. gouache painting outside with this group and that's like how i was thinking it's just gouache is also very much like eh, i mean it's pretty like you can't really undo too much with gouache <laughs> um it's not as bad as watercolor but yeah yeah uh, so yeah it's it's very i i I think a lot of uh, traditional painters have been attracted to it for that reason too, where it's like, it's sort of similar to regular painting. Um, and even the early versions didn't have an eyedropper yeah. and didn't have undo and people were really into that, you know, <laughs> they're like, wow, it's so, it's so scary. And yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. But, and then, but I, you know what I found too, is like, I've been, I've been working on this layers version for the past few months, like a, a complete rebuild from scratch of heavy paint. And I tried to add in layers and eraser and masking and all these features that um, I wanted for like production stuff. And it worked fine for production stuff. But then 
just now I'm starting to realize, wait a minute, like I am not having as much fun painting with all the layers and extra new features that I spent three months on. What do I do? You know? So now I'm thinking, man, man, maybe I should just have that stuff turned off by default. So it's like a, a different mode, like you were saying, like you have a production or full features mode, and then you have a just regular painting mode just for so you can enjoy it and like focus and be in the zone. Yeah. Because the layers actually does like it takes you out of the zone. Transforming, moving things around takes you out of the zone because then you're not like you're not drawing for your life, you know, like drawing like your de life depends on it, because if you screw up, you're hmm. you screwed up. Yeah. Yeah. The stakes. Stakes are much some lower. Stakes, right? I yeah. think. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, for so sure. You, this is also the process of learning. Like if you have Andu, especially if you are like some kind of more perfectionistic person, like compulsive, I don't know, obsessive compulsive, you can really get stuck uh, on trying to make this perfect line and Andu, Andu. And yeah. I remember when we were drawing, for example, at college, and we we used uh, pencils, so you could always use the the, the rubber. Mm -hmm. But uh, I know I remember myself and also especially some some my colleagues that they got so frustrated with not being able to draw something that they would press the pencil harder and harder and harder, <laughs> or, or at some point you were not. You were not able to really, uh, you know, like erase it. Mm -hmm. So they would take some bigger, uh, bigger pencil or uh, like more, um, more less hard pencil, and it, it at some point is there's this, and they press it so much and draw over the existing image uh, drawing so many times that finally they had this shape, and it was like this shape was like heavy from from the from coal and <laughs> yeah but it yeah. would uh, it would have like this very nice uh feeling to that because you could see that that work in that image and of course and in terms of in, the, in in a longer shot you learned something on this because you i mean if like i had this problem with i remember my teacher told me that I, I i i had an order from him that i'm not allowed to use the rubber for eraser for for like first two hours of drawing or, or on one hour mm -hmm. Be because i would uh, especially at first when i was learning i was attending some lessons i would just i, I think this is this is like a um, habit of many hobbyists or like kids from from school like i was that that you think that this using the eraser is very important to to make this perfect shape or a shade and she told me, no, no, you shouldn't do this. And, yeah, and at that's... first, my, my images, when I stopped using the rubber, they looked terrible. Like, it would look like <laughs> I'm some kind of special kid, you know? <laughs> okay. Like drawing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But after some time, it's like re rewires your brain when when you, you are doing this that way. Yeah. You have to learn to fall. You have to learn to fall. It's like you're learning, you know, judo. <laughs> the first thing you learn is how to fall. Right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But for example, but for example, right now because there is Krita, for example. So, uh, if you would like to, you know, uh, advertise your software, what's the um, upper hand of 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 your application of oh, That's that's so Krita. difficult, so difficult for me to say. I feel like mm -hmm. I am the worst salesperson in the world, or close to it. So I. Uh, I'll, I'll say what, what, what other people say about it is that they like that it's much, it's very simple, it's very direct, it feels like traditional, there's not, it's not very overwhelming. But what I take all of those things to mean, and, and some, a lot of people say it's fun actually, but those words aren't like super descriptive of what is actually different about it. And to me, I think the, the technical side of what's what's different is is again it's the priority of stuff like arranging the stuff and also it's it's kind of difficult to to compare Krita to heavy paint because heavy paint is um you know it's on mobile and I don't know if Krita is on mobile yet or is it I don't know because yeah desktop and mobile is is kind of a whole nother animal but 
I it's okay. Heavy paint is only a few tools, but like very finely crafted, like very refined and made to be super enjoyable and just nice. I don't know how to explain it properly, but uh, <laughs> that's true. I mean, the closest the application is to real drawing, the better the the, mo the better it feels to use it. Like yeah, if it's 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 very light and uh, and quick, then it's it's gives that feeling. And I also noticed one thing that when I first uh, used your uh, application, I thought, okay, these are very crappy brushes. Yeah, and <laughs> I thought, oh, and then I then I watched some of your tutorials, and the, one of the things I noticed that you are using some of the. Uh, like r r right now there are old painting techniques but you know like uh, impressionists used or other schools for example uh, where you don't mix the mm, the colors to get this particular hue and and use it but for example you place orange next to green next to orange next to green and at some point it gives you some kind of the general color uh, impression mm -hmm. and i haven't seen it a lot uh, when i'm looking at uh, dig digital painters they usually use that exact uh, color they need and i was thinking hey so so yeah this this tool is 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 kind of forcing kind of forcing that because and uh, you know it, it, when you open krita and let's say you haven't you have have never used any kind of you have never painted actually let's say you can make like a one stroke of of with this one of these brushes and it looks great like it looks very nice one very nice line and these ones are kind of like uh, raw but i noticed on your tutorials that then you have to start to thinking in in, in a little other way when you mix colors and 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 get your shape yeah this is my I, this is my impression i think that i think raw is a good word for it it is very raw i think it keeps you honest as an artist like yeah you you it's very brutal almost like the color just shoves out right away there's no opacity or anything so you have to like very carefully pick your colors but hopefully it i hope that it makes people that use it make more bolder with their colors or more comfortable choosing colors and um, at least even to practice that, because honestly, most most of the time people avoid picking colors. They avoid mixing colors digitally. They use opacity and they use color picking a lot. And I, I do too. So I, I want people to avoid those things when they use heavy paint as much as possible and just directly pick yeah. colors. I think it's like a, li a little bit like in music, like nowadays, a, a lot of you know studio production, you have all those fancy toys that you can make music with like super duper effects that you can put on your guitar or whatever vocals auto tune all the all those fancy toys but when you really want to make music you just need you know a simple raw instrument yourself your voice whatever and and then it's really music right then, then you can hear if there is music really yeah or not. yeah and again i don't want to say that any other app is is not doing it the right way because you know Sometimes you need the the full suite of everything and the studio and mixing and effects and like you need to have everything there. And and those apps are like way, way ahead of heavy paint in terms of a lot of, you know, tech and like work and abilities. It's uh so yeah, I I, I need to work on this. Like I don't want to put any other software down because I, you know, like I've been using every everyone else and stuff and they're an inspiration to me. Like I love all these softwares. I love Alchemy and Photoshop and Painter and I've like used everything basically. And uh so they're all like inspirations too. But yeah, I this is just my my thing with my idea. So it's like very precious to me. It's my little tiny pet uh project and I really love working on it. Um, yeah, I wanted to to ask one question about like your personal preference, because we 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 kind of throughout this whole conversation we saw your like two sides of you like one is the the artistic side I would say and the other one is like the technical side, 
like the developer of the app and it's, uh, what's what's more alluring for you like m- what's more fun for you like solving oh. technical problems or or the creative process of painting and you know that's a creating re- stuff. that's a really good question and um you know what i i think i'm right now i'm really enjoying the technical programming side because it's it's really fun and it actually is very creative as well it's like uh you know solving a puzzle and you have to get around these problems and come up with all these weird like abstract uh machine you're like building lots of little tiny machines that can help you do your job or whatever uh, which i'm sure you guys know like running a render farm you're like automating a lot of stuff and it's very exciting when it all works finally so i really i really love i'm loving programming now and i've always had a side you know even from when i was really little i i, I always thought oh i want to be an engineer you know my my uncle was an electrical engineer so i wanted to be you know maybe i'll be an electrical engineer my dad was like a, a self-taught programmer and he would always be showing me like hey Vaughn, look this is the internet wow isn't this cool or Oh, this is Linux. I'm like, wow, Linux looks super lame, dad. That's so boring. <laughs> and so, but now I feel like, wow, okay, it, it is kind of exciting. It's pretty cool. Maybe that that is a side of me that just now is like finally coming out. So I'm happy to have discovered it, I guess. But at the same time, I noticed that I will go through phases a lot where I sometimes I like 3D. Sometimes I like painting, sometimes I like drawing, and I just like go in a little circle all the time, chasing my own tail. And that's how I keep myself entertained, I guess. Wow. Um, so I like everything pretty much. But right now- I have no idea I, how, th- that, is such a, that is such a reassuring thing to hear. Cause that's, that, I think like personally, that's my, that's my like regular struggle. It's like um, you're spending too much time on like the two D stuff. Well, you haven't really, I mean, you haven't really done how, anything in three D for so long. How old are you though? Right? How long do you have to live? Because we, we, you don't have to do everything all at once. You can do one thing now and do something else later. <laughs> like, exactly. You no, know, that that is true. Yeah. Um, as long as you're, I enjoying guess it's just it. kind of like, yeah. Yeah, I mean. Like, this is going to sound super, like, uh, I mean, not meaning to be a downer or anything, but I guess, like, no, or I don't know. I think, like, just honestly, this whole, like, the whole pandemic thing, um, like, people around me have, like, you know, like, like, I think, I think most of us have, have, uh, or may have, like, lost or almost lost someone to the, to this whole thing. And, like, it kind of, it well, basically this like this this last year kind of really introduced a lot of um i don't know like existential qu- no not yeah, ex- but you know I, questions about life I, generally and exactly and i did end up wondering like how like can i keep thinking this way like like can i keep do, like do i really do I really have a whole life ahead of me? I mean, because this thing was pretty like this. I mean, it it got like yeah. it. This is probably the realest like. Uh, I mean, well, you know, this is the this is the only like major pandemic that that like I've felt in my lifetime. So okay, well, how about you know, how about looking at it another way? Where, let's say, you know, the pandemic made you appreciate life more, right? you're like okay now is the only time i have so i have to spend it well then that means that you should be doing what you are really into right now you shouldn't be doing anything else you should only do Uh like what you really really want to do because who knows you get hit by a bus tomorrow whatever i mean like i'm not saying you go like party and do a bunch of drugs right now but just like (laughs) yeah you know what i mean like yeah you not total viking mode but like you deserve to spend your time how you see fit you know like you don't have to do things for other people all the time i mean i don't know that's a very selfish way to think also no no i mean i think but yes no i i get it like because you might also just be like 
mm, the whole like uh the whole f- like um like the future mark or the future the future Vaughn thing you know like what will what will future what will future me thank me for mm-hmm. like that can also kind of be a uh, like really inhibiting sometimes and who are you to say really what your future self will have, you know like you don't like yeah we don't really know for sure mm-hmm. so yeah i mean i yeah that's a good point actually and in in our field like computer graphics it's uh uh the first thing is that at least for me the 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 quarantine and the pandemic at first at least was it, it changed nothing because i was working from home out and away so mm-hmm. i was i knew all that stuff maybe right now after a year i'm starting to getting a little crazy but but it was not it was not such a difficult stuff and also i noticed that many people when they have to switch change something in their job or what they do they have to physically they have to do it physically so like friends a friend of mine found the job he wanted to do only after going from poland to let's say to denmark because there was an offer there and for example if you want to try something you need to go there physically and uh, like when you are a CG artist, the op- there's also almost too too many options. Like there is so many similar fields mm-hmm. which you can try and evolve to, or that it's just you know a matter of of uh, downloading I don't know ZBrush de- demo or or DaVinci Resolve post production coloring. So it's it's very easy I think in for 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 people who work in our in our area. Yeah, we're, to we're pretty lucky. Very lucky. So, by, by the way, we had an interview with Cheyenne Mondal, and I think he, he I don't know if, if, if DJ, you basically you are looking for such guests, uh, but he had a very similar approach to yours. Like, um, the, the kind of the kind of renegade path, right? <laughs> quitting, quitting school <laughs> and following your dreams. <laughs> like, <laughs> so uh, Jo- joining the, the 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 coding the the creating software and um he's actually creating uh the procedural uh materials and being an artist mm. uh i think this is something that a lot of people would envy you that you can create your own painting painting tool like uh, also like sometimes i i use krita and also i have I would have ideas what what would be useful, like more realistic, uh, like uh, colors, the the paints being being mixed on the canvas in a more realistic physical way, mm-hmm. like the 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 watercolors have their way because you know it's like almost the water can suck can suck the neighboring color into the 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 uh, yeah the the that's the true. other one yeah that's and pretty pretty advanced so now you can now you can just you know join the beta testers of heavy paint and just contribute to your yeah <laughs> i'm open to your suggestions. observations uh, i don't have impression that this software that it's it's going this way actually i, I wanted to do a, an experiment and for example use um use some uh, fluid uh, simulation in for example in cinema 4d create a real pencil and try to paint this way to to oh, wow. simulate uh, like i mean this kind of feature would be very cool in 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 drawing in general in, in painting apps well i have like, you have you used that app called um rebel painter i think it's called rebel like r-e-b-e-l-l-e because oh, that yeah. one's i mean i, I really good uh you know media effects like that like well fully simulated everything super realistic um so yeah that one looks yeah. pretty cool it's one of those like real paint emulators mm-hmm. right like that's that's what it's known yeah. for like i i've also tried um corel painter i'm not like i kind of only really like dipped my feet on uh in each but it seemed like um like 
the impression for example Corel left on me was like it it was pretty it was it was kind of crazy how like even like the way their brushes worked was not really kind of that that repeating stamp approach anymore mm-hmm. and that um I'm not sure if you'd call it a simulation really but then it really did feel like you were working with actual bristles on the tip of your stylus it was pretty pretty neat but also um yeah no actually it was like for if that if that was sort of uh someone's thing i guess like trying to emulate like uh like the medium itself maybe more than the the process then yeah like it's it's pretty like yeah it's pretty interesting to see that like there's there's stuff like that out there as mm-hmm. well yeah like everybody's got different priorities basically and those uh, those those ones I really admire for being so technical, like that. That's a really smart guy stuff, like big brain stuff, you know, doing all the simulations and uh, that's a whole nother yeah. thing. Yeah, that's, so maybe maybe one <clears throat> one final question is how how you manage to you know get over getting an, getting an Oscar in the life after oh <laughs> and what's the plan like what's the what's the next bi- next big goal that you maybe set for yourself and I don't know heavy paint or whatever heavy poly thing and congratulations by the way yeah. oh yeah uh, huge props thanks guys that. um well I guess I I uh in terms of next goals I want to definitely want to keep working on this heavy paint thing like for me as I, I consider this like my best project so far heavy paint like um this is the thing i'm the most passionate about and and it's mainly because you know i get to see other people using it and there's a lot of you know communication and stuff cuz usually i'm just by myself all the time working so it's nice to like put something out in the world and see you know people interact with it and then even something like this like doing an interview about it is really exciting and fun for me and so yeah i i definitely want to keep going with it see how far it goes um play with it but after that i don't know I don't, maybe do a video game at some point you know everybody wants to make a video game someday right <laughs> but, but um, <laughs> No. Well, I don't. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. I'm the only one. Uh, no, I I think animation to me is very very difficult and and stressful and it's a lot of work. So it's a very tough industry that I've been doing you know animation stuff since you know 2012. So I think who knows maybe heavy paint is like the first step in a in a transition into other stuff or maybe i end up back i don't know i have no idea but i try not to think about the past stuff too much just like honestly i wake up in the morning and i'll probably have an email from someone saying like hey there's a bug or like it crashed or you know one star review or something like that and then i have to go fix it and so i don't have any time to you know think about anything too grand but but uh, I I do want to see see where it goes. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep pursuing this this thing because I have a good feeling about it, you know. And I I, I try to tr- trust my gut usually, and yeah. So I'm gonna trust trust my gut and keep going. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm I will surely and yeah I think be like the the heavy paint soon because uh, recently I had like uh, a birthday present which I'm re- still waiting for arrival a uh, new drawing tablet nice this kind of display display tablet you know the fir- first time that when I, when I will be drawing with this kind of a device oh, awesome. i'm really curious about how it how it will work with so with heavy paint right cool so so some testing ahead yay nice mm. and I th- all right I think, well i think it was a really really fun conversation we're already over an hour yeah so i guess we'll be wrapping <laughs> up and <laughs> <laughs> went fast yeah but again thanks for went super fast. thanks for joining us for this episode yeah and uh yeah the real honor to have you here man. yeah thank you guys for for inviting me on again it was um i'm really happy to do it and 
I had a lot of fun talking. I mean, like, I, I hope it wasn't too much. I, I talking about myself is a little bit sickening sometimes, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, try, I'll no. try, try to keep it interesting. But uh, yeah, I've, I've heard on your on one, was definitely one of your live, recent live streams, like we were mentioning, you know, this this becoming talkative through a dentist operation or something like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, did, you didn't seem very tongue tied. Right uh, during this uh, conversation, so yeah, I guess it was really good. You know, I think you don't need any kind of operations there. So. Cool. All right, or I'll I'll hold implants. off on it. I'll hold off on the plastic <laughs> surgery. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Well, yeah. Cool. So. All right. So, thanks a lot again. Thanks. And uh, for everyone listening, I guess this wraps it up. Yeah, so we'll leave you, we'll leave see you, you all, the, the, next all the necessary links in the description. Of so, course, so you can as follow, always. you know, follow, like, and download Heavy Paint. Follow false yeah. artwork if you haven't already, as I'm sure most of you people listening already know Heavy Poly and all the stuff around. Yeah. So, oh, maybe you'd like to, maybe you'd like to uh, mention. Um, uh, like where where can people find you? Oh, um, mo- mainly Instagram at Heavy Poly or um, HeavyPoly.com is the site, and then HeavyPaint.app is the app site. Um, but yeah, th- that's cool. the main stuff. All right, okay. people. So, all right. So that's it for today, <laughs> and thank you all for listening in, and see you in the next episode of. CG Talks. I mean, here. (laughs) Bye. Uh, Bye. (laughs) Bye. All right.